got your Bible, say amen. amen. Y'all sound so enthusiastic. <laughs> Okay, thank you. That's, there you go. That's good. As long as you're thinking, that's good. And my wife always says they can't talk with their mouth full, dear. <laughs> All right. Uh, we're going to, we're going to, I wanted to finish this up today, but I just honestly couldn't see any way to do this. Uh, so we're going to, we're going to fix it so we'll finish it up next week with a Lessons from Gideon, Part 2. Judges Chapter 6. Get your Bibles out. Turn to Judges Chapter 6. Stand for the reading of the Word. We're just gonna, we're gonna, gonna, maybe not start at verse one like we've had to do. And let's start over. Let's start, well, let's go ahead and start at verse one because if you haven't been in here, you might not know exactly where we're coming from. And the children of Israel, verse one, chapter six, verse one, and the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. And remember, evil in the sight of the Lord does not mean necessarily that you're doing bad stuff, it just means you're doing it your way. <clears throat> so sometimes it is bad stuff, and sometimes you're just doing it your way. And you'll find out that one of the biggest problems here is they're doing it their way. And how can you tell? Watch this. Anybody here ever done it your way? And then ask God to come in and clean your mess up. I'm raising my hand. <laughs> That's right. Okay. And to the visible, <clears throat> did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, because the Midianites, the children of Israel, made them dens which or in the mountains and caves and strongholds. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them, and they encamped against them and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou uh, come to Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep nor ox nor ass. For they came up with their cattle in their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. Can you imagine... Have you ever felt like the enemy come against you without number? I mean, it was just coming on and coming on and never stop. So they came without number, for both they and their camels were without number, and they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites, and the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. Say, now they're crying unto the Lord. That's why I say, remember, they were doing it their way, and their way did not work. Some might say, your way has not been working. Now I put your finger to your chest and say, my way has not been working. My way has not been working. All right. So it came to pass the children of Israel cried to the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all that oppressed you, and drove them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God. Fear not the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord, and said unto Oak, which is in Ophrah, and pertained unto Joash, the Abethite, and his son Gideon, threshed wheat by the winepress to hide from the Midianites. Now Gideon's hiding. He's hiding. Somebody say hiding. Amen. Amen. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Look, now say, look. Say, with God, you can run, but you can't hide. <laughs> and the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Ha! Why don't I do that? The man's hiding. He's not a mighty man of valor. He's hiding. We'll go a little further and we'll see what's going on here, okay? And Gideon said to him, O Lord, if thou be with us, why then is all this befalling us? And where be all the miracles that our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us through the hands of the Midianites. The Lord hath forsaken them. They had forsaken the Lord. They were doing it their way. And the Lord looked unto him and said, Go with this thou might, and thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianite. Have I not sent thee? And he said unto them, O Lord, Wherewith shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is poor Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Say, again, does that sound like a mighty man of valor? He's saying, My family is the lowest in the whole bunch, and I'm even lower than they are. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I'll be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. Father, let's pray. Father, I love you. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. 
I know, God, you're alive and well on the throne, Father. I know, God, there's absolutely nothing impossible for you. As you're going to minister to us and through us, Father, help us, God, to see what you have for us to do in this last day and to be ready for whatever comes our way. In the name of Jesus, we love you and we thank you for what you're doing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And church said, amen. amen. Way down, get somebody a high five, low five, no five, some kind of five. And say, say, if you're not here after what I'm here after, you'll be here after I'm gone. Say that. <laughs> a couple years ago, I, I entered into a race, and then the race started. Immediately, I was the last of the runners. It was embarrassing. <laughs> the guy who was in front of me, uh, Brandon, he was... <laughs> And the guy was in front of me, Brandon, second to last, was making fun of me. He said, hey, buddy, how's it feel to be last? I said, you really want to know? Then I dropped out of the race. <laughs> All right, then. That was funny to me than it was to y'all. Amen. <laughs> I said, I know it's no joke. It's all that's how to put some people's name into that. Kind of press it up. My wife tells me all the time, said, you sit there. Have a, have a little party all by yourself, aren't you? <laughs> I'm reading and laughing and carrying on, and she goes, can you let me in on it? <laughs> and I'll tell her, she goes, huh? <laughs> okay, just let's just, just go over a few little things kind of briefly here to kind of get us all on the same page. Uh, uh, there's old Gideon blowing his trumpet, amen? Gideon is a mighty example of how God can take a nobody. He had an inferiority complex. That's why I laughed when I said mighty man of valor. He, was not, he, he, he didn't realize what was inside of him. He was going by what he was feeling, and what he was feeling was not mighty man of valor. That's part of what we're going to be talking about coming up on Tuesday nights. People that are going through stuff, need fear and all that, we're going to get, teach them how to reconnect uh, to the present and get beyond this mess and, 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 and find some deliverance. And when I said deliverance, when I said deliverance, the thing about it being a, a real thing and the preachers up here preaching and, and casting demons out of people, that's deliverance. That is deliverance, but there's also some deliverance when, when God takes the fear out of my heart, then that's deliverance. When God helps me deal with my grief, that's deliverance. When I can, can get up and walk outside without feeling that pain and scary wanting to go back in the house, that's deliverance. So, so let's, let's put deliverance down on a level where everybody uh, can, can buy into it. So, so he took a nobody. He had an inferiority complex. Uh, he was led by fear because he ran, and he had a victim mentality. He was hid. You know, uh, it is so easy, so easy. You know, uh, I'm going to do a sermon coming up shortly on the ants. There's ants in there. I don't know if we call it ants in my hat, ants in my yard, ants in my garden, but automatic negative thoughts that we all have. And these automatic negative thoughts are sent to us from Satan, sent to us from our flesh. They're sent from us from the world. And when we get these negative thoughts, uh, automatically it, it, it bends the way we see things and it puts a different lens on us and we don't see things the way they are and we actually wind up it as a victim or we wind up being led by fear or we have that inferiority complex. We're going to talk about that in a couple of weeks. But, but we see all this stuff going on in his life, but, it's, but it's Bible, or the Bible here tells us how God turned him around and used him to make a difference in that uh, situation. Of course, can you imagine they're coming at you without number? They're coming at you just, just, just to keep up their army. They're destroying everything in the land so they don't have anything for their own self because the other army is consuming every resource that they have. So, so what Gideon, Gideon could see was that they were under attack, and it looked like God was silent. It looked like because God was silent, he depended on himself, and because he had to depend on himself, literally, he was hiding. And again, does that, does that kind of sound familiar? Have you found yourself kind of trying to stay out of the way of people, trying to just, just, just kind of survive? And how many here has ever had a time where you just tried to survive? You weren't trying to nick at the problem. You weren't trying to, to help the problem. You just didn't want the problem to hurt you anymore. So instead of trying to, to overwhelm the problem, you let the problem overwhelm you. And as the problem is overwhelming you, you find yourself just trying to survive. So, 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 so I've done that. We've all done that. We're human. We will do that sometimes.
sometimes, I, you know, uh, uh, recently with Beth and his death, there's been some times where I just said, Lord, if I could just go just go somewhere and cry for like a week, I think I'd be okay. Or Lord, if I could just hide somewhere. But, but you can't because it's go, 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 go. There's always something and you're always facing. So I have discovered that either you process your fears or you process your grief, you process it or it will process you. And so and I've not told you before, I've told you a bunch, but... I have that CD from Bethany's funeral. When I get in my car, in a safe place, in my car where there's nobody else around, just me and God, I can put that, put it in and play it. And as every time it plays, I know exactly where I was sitting. I know exactly what was going on. I even remember the thoughts that were in my head during that funeral service when that song was played. And it hurt so bad, but I go back and play it <coughs> again and again, called repetitive therapy. And what it does is it doesn't necessarily take the pain away. It just helps me to handle that pain. So, so <coughs> I'm so allergic to artificial flowers. Isn't that something? Here we go. So, so, so here we are. He was hiding. Just trying to survive. Just trying to get through the day. I've heard so many people tell me, just trying to, just trying to make it. Just trying to get through the day. So, again, uh, uh, this is from last week, and then we're getting ready to go right into this new stuff. Your fear can be passed down. Did you know that? The fear that you possess can be passed down. Uh, again, it says, uh, but Lord, how can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in Israel. They are the weakest. How can, how can I uh, do anything about this thing? And see, watch this now. When you live by fear, you'll be led by fear, and you'll leave others your fear. Think about it. When you live by fear. You say, well, I don't live by fear. I, I heard him go, if one of your constant, one of your constant words that you say, one of your constant phrases is, I'm afraid that. I'm afraid that. I'm afraid that. Let me tell you something. There's a good opportunity for you to be living by fear. Matter of fact, I, I've tried to quit saying I'm afraid that. I will say, I'm concerned about this. Uh, this brings thoughts in my mind or whatever, but I won't say I'm afraid of that because, again, you, your body, did you know that your, your, your subconscious mind is working all the time? Even while you're talking, you may not, I may not hear what you're saying, but my subconscious mind is gathering information all around. And so that's why you have to watch. That's why God tells us to watch what we see and what we do because, because this stuff is still being gathered everywhere in your mind and it'll play back to you in the weirdest times when you don't really want it played back. Or when you don't need it to be played back. When you need to be walking strong, you can't walk strong because the stuff that you're hearing is coming out through your mouth. And there you go, I'm afraid that I can't do that. I'm afraid that we won't be able to make that. I'm afraid that we can't, can't, can't. So when you live by fear, you'll be led by fear. And, and others will have it too. So Gideon, Gideon was under attack, right? All he could see was that God was silent. He was depending on himself. But God was not silent. Not one bit. God was just waiting to be invited in. Let me ask you a question. What I just said, God was not silent. God was waiting to be invited into the problem. Some of you on here right now, you may be going through something and you're wondering, God, why don't you help me? And God's saying, oh, why don't you let me? There's a difference in acknowledging God and inviting Him in. You can say, I can't do this without God's help. And you say, well, I've already invited Him in. No, you just acknowledged that you needed Him. You have to invite Him in to the process in order that God can do what He's trying to do in your life. So, so, so watch this. Here we go. Now, now we're going to do this. Here it goes. When tough times come, Instead of looking at them as if God is punishing you, here it goes. Hold on to your hats. When tough times come, instead of looking at them as if God is punishing you, try to see them as God's gift of grace. Since we got some of these guys on television that tells you that if you got any kind of problem, something's wrong. There's one coming on every morning. Sometimes I just watch them to hear. And see what he's got to say. And every time he starts talking about, and 
And if you really believe that God can handle all your problems, send us a thousand dollars. When tough times come, does not mean, look, doesn't mean you've done something bad. Listen carefully. When tough times come, instead of looking at them as if God's punishing you, try thinking about it in a different way. See them as God's gift of grace. So, again, the first thing God was going to do, he was going to help Gideon move beyond his fear. So here it goes. Y'all ready? Going over, hang on, lady, we're going for a ride. Y'all remember that off of Indiana Jones? Just before he cut that bridge. <laughs> here we go. Cut the bridge. Here we go. Hard times like a washing machine. <laughs> Hard times like a washing machine. They twist, turn, knock us all around, but in the end we come out cleaner, brighter, better than before. Wow. Some of us are getting some Ajaxing right now. Don't like it. Matter of fact, it kind of takes my breath away sometimes, but it's okay. So, so get ready. <laughs> First thing he found out was God uses tough times to get our attention. Listen to this. Actually, God uses tough times to bring out the tough in us. <laughs> All I can think about. And, and I've heard I've heard Doug talk about it, I've heard other guys talk about it in boot camp. I bet you never told your told your sergeant, stop, that's that that's just that stop that please. <laughs> Do you think you can lower that rope just a little bit more so I can get to a lot easier, sir? <laughs> no, you didn't, did you? You did what they said. Amen. And did it with did it with 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 with, uh, with quickly. Did what they said. Uh God, and what it was doing to toughen you up, get you ready. God uses tough times to bring out the tough in us. Some of us don't even realize how tough we are. You know, some of us are walking around like Pee Wee Herman, not thinking that we got a clean Eastwood inside of us. Think about it. Some of you have no idea how much you can take because you've never been tried to the point where you had to get down and pull out what you had in you. And God doesn't want a bunch of softies running around. God needs somebody that's tough, that can handle it, that can get through the tough times and, and help lead other people out. So first, he uses tough times to bring out tough enough to direct us. Watch this. To direct us up. When the tough times come, I know now I've got to depend on God. If I don't depend on God, it's not going to happen. God has to be in this thing. God has to work. If God's not working, that's, that's impossible. I have to have God. So tough times directs us up. I gotta pray. I gotta touch God. I gotta let God touch me. But also it draws us out. It draws the tough out. You know, I, I, I can remember all through the years, especially in the early years, there was a, you know, like God, God would come to me and go, you know, I really feel called to preach. I said, okay, let's, let's start working through this thing. And I would hear the way they would preach, and then I'd watch as they as they started going through things. As they started going through things, the way they preached was different. Before they went through things, they used cliches. They used the latest whatever they heard, whatever that sounded good. But as they started going through stuff, started fighting hard battles, all of a sudden their preaching changed. Their preaching got down to earth. Their preaching was how to get through things and how to handle things. It wasn't how God was going to stop everything from coming. It was going to be rainbows and and, and, and cupcakes all the time. And so, again, it directs me to look up. When stuff happens, I'm looking up. But at the same time, God's bringing it out. I remember when, when I remember to look on the doctor's face. Bethany was over, was over on one side of the cancer center in palliative care. They didn't even move her. They let her stay right there. They didn't move her downstairs. They left her right there. So Beth is in palliative care, and Linda's on the other end with the blood clots, and she's hooked up to a heart monitor and oxygen. And I was walking from one end of the hall to the other, going back and forth. And one of my many trips during the day, I walked up onto the hospitalist. And, and, and normally they come to me and tell me things. This time he walked up to me with his arms held out. And so I didn't exactly know what was going on, but he walked to me, and, and he just grabbed me and squeezed me. And he said, man, I'm so sorry. I am so, so sorry. He says, I don't know how in the world. I just don't know. I don't know what to say. I don't know what to do to tell you. He said, but, but, but God's got, and he said, God's got this. I said, I know God's got this, Doc. 
And he said, he said, I know tough times come, but this has got to be the toughest. And I said, well, you know what, Doc? I said, we serve a tough God. And I said, God knows what, can, what we can take and what we can't take. And God's got this. And he just said, well, if, if you need me, you just let me know. And I said, yes, sir. And I saw him Saturday while I was there looking, working with Stephen uh, and, and Frankie. Uh, I saw him again. He said, and he grabbed me and squeezed me. And, and I said, it's okay, Doc. You know, God, God's got this. God has got this. I've learned that, that, that the stuff we go through, we make you stronger. I want you to say something with me. Ready? You're going to say this with me now. Get ready. I want y'all to say it loud and proud. No, not no. Here you go. Ready? Here you go. Ready? I want y'all to say it loud and proud. Ready? Ready? My trouble didn't happen to me. It happened for me. Say it loud and proud. My trouble didn't happen to me, it happened for me. One more time. My trouble didn't happen to me, it happened for me. What does that mean? I'll tell you, I bet you ask. <laughs> if all I can think of is all this is happening to me, I become a victim. Oh, what was me? That's what exactly what Gideon was saying. Why did all this happen to us, God? If, if you were keeping your promises like you said and did everything you said you were going to do, why is all this happening to me? My trouble didn't happen to me. It happened for me because I know that in my trouble, God's already got, look, Satan may have his finger on the, on the trigger, but God's got his hand on the throttle. And God's throttling it back. God knows what I can take and what I can't take. And God knows what I need and what I don't need. And so because of that, I know there's a peace in my heart. Ebony Kessler, that whole time with Beth, the last three weeks, there was a peace in my heart. It just, it was an unbelievable peace in my heart. And it was because I just kept look, talking to Bethany, and Bethany would tell me, God's got this. She said, Dad, either way I win. And, and I was hearing that, and her talking, when she could talk, and, and what I was seeing, and the things that were going on, I just felt this incredible peace inside of me. And I, was just, I kept saying, this trouble did not happen to me. It didn't happen to us. It happened for us. Amen? Because God's going to get some glory in all this, and something amazing is going to happen. So number one, tough times. God used them to get our attention. Number two, I love this. God sees more than we do. He sees yesterday, tomorrow, and today, all at one time. All we can see is today. We can only see what's in front of us. We can anticipate what's happening a minute from now, but we can't see what's happening a minute from now. We have memories of what happened, but even a lot of times the memories of what happened winds up getting skewed in our mind and we get seeing things a little different than it actually was. But God is not a subject of time. He stands back and he sees from the time we were born to the time we die, all at one time. That's how he can go move back and forth and he can take care of his and fix it for us and fix things and arrange things. God sees more than we do. And it came to pass, let's see here. Let me read a little further here. Let's see here. I'm going to try to get it. And there came an angel of the Lord sent unto the oak, which was in Oprah, that pertained unto Joash, the, the uh, of Israelite, and his son Gideon threshed wheat by the winepress and hid it, hid it from the Midianites. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Think about this now. Thou mighty man of valor. He did not look like a mighty man of valor. He looked like Pee Wee Herman. But God saw Clint Eastwood in him. God was fixed to do something in him that was amazing. And God was going to bring out in him the champion that was in him. Gideon was actually looking, he was gauging himself. He was a thermometer. All he saw was is what was going around. He was gauging himself on what was going around. And God said, you're not a thermometer, you're a thermostat. The difference is a thermometer just reads what's out, reaches out, what it sees, it reports. But a thermometer, a thermostat... You take it and you adjust it where you want it. It reaches out and reads what's going on and then it makes the adjustments to make it happen the way it's supposed to. And so he saw this. He knew that Gideon was a champion. It just had to be brought out. You see, Gideon didn't act like a mighty warrior. 
Uh, you know, uh, all he could see was what was going on around him. He, he saw the conditions. He saw the circumstances. And all he could ask was how. Why? How many times you look at your circumstances and go, how? Why? God sees our past, our present, our future, all at one time. And he says, I know how. And he asks, why not? Let's see another guy. How I many when you look at the Apostle Peter, you think that was his name? No. What was his name? Simon. Simon means read. It was actually like his temperament. He was like a reed. Depending on what was going on around him, he was going this way or going that way. He was always tossed back to and fro. He would talk a big game, but he couldn't back it up. He always got his foot in his mouth. He had hoof him out to these disease so bad. But Jesus called him Peter, which means rock. When Jesus called him Peter, you know what he was doing? The same thing when that angel said, you mighty man of power. Jesus knew that this man would go back and forth with the wind. He would go back and forth with what was going on. He would open his mouth. He would commit to things he couldn't do or wouldn't do or would change in a moment's notice. And he said, when I get through with you, you're going to be a rock. And I'm going to use you along with your brothers to help build this church. So now, God sees more all the time. Sees more than we do. God has a plan for you. How many know that? Can somebody tell me what Jeremiah 29 11 says? I'll see if Mike can tell me that. Holler at somebody. A little bit louder there, brother. I know the thoughts that I think toward you, say it, the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you perspective. All right, that's awesome. Give the Lord a hand clap. There you go. God already knows what he's going to do with you, right? So watch this. Again, God sees more than we do. That's what we're talking about here. Here we go. Watch this. So, this is Simon, which means read. He calls him Peter, which means rock. And he knew that Peter was going to just, he knew, his, he knew his makeup. He deserted Jesus in the garden. He denied that he knew Jesus three times in his trial. And he disappeared behind closed doors. But the day was coming. It's so, it's so awesome. Acts 4 13. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men, they were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. Wow. It's amazing how people change when you get up and Jesus gets a hold of you. Amen. Now, and this is the last one. Get ready to go. Y'all look at the sign and say, Praise God. <laughs> Here we go. We'll finish up next week. God's with you every step of the way. Every step of the way. God confirms his presence with you when you're doing his stuff. Watch. And the Lord asked you to get in and said, I'll be with you so you can defeat the Midianites as easily if they were only one man. There were more than he could ever even imagine. But he's telling you fight them as if they're one man. Can you imagine that? Wow. That means God's going to make you able for the task that is ahead of you. So watch this. I want you to watch carefully. As long as we're standing still or moving backwards, don't expect his powerful presence. One more time. As long as we're standing still or moving forward backwards, don't expect to experience his powerful presence. But when we advance, when we become more than spectators, God shows up in a very powerful way. How many have ever seen them on their own power? Ever seen an aircraft carrier turn itself to dock? I think it takes 10 miles from an aircraft carrier to turn around. So in order for an aircraft carrier to be turning, to be, to, to be useful, it has to be moving. 
has to be a getting around. A train, a New York train, one of those underground trains, you can take a two by four and you can stick it down on the track and if it's going at full speed, it won't even notice that it was there. But that same train, if you chop the wheel, it can't take off with that same little piece of wood. Satan wants to keep us locked down, chopped, keep us from moving. Because as long as we're moving, doing something for him, God's going to do something special for us. But when we're sitting back and playing victim, you know what? I don't want to be a victim. I want to be a, I want to be a victor. And so if I want to be a victor, I've got to be up doing something for God. Amen? Amen? And again, here it goes. Here it is. And we're getting ready to close. BJ, come up here and play something, bro. God is about to rock somebody's world. Amen? I believe with all my heart, God is fixing to rock somebody's world. He's going to totally change them. I believe there's somebody like here right now Within a few months, you're going to be doing stuff for God you never thought possible. Doesn't matter your age. Doesn't matter your background. God wants to use you. Everybody stand. heard it said so many times God's not so much caring about your ability as he is your availability I remember when I I got one of the biggest lessons when I was coaching football at a school in uh, Benson, North Carolina I got a chance to, to coach the defense. And I remember <laughs> I had this little guy smaller than Daniel. But that's the big guys. They were big as DC. And some of these big guys, how many's ever heard of a shirt tackle? tackle somebody, instead of doing a correct tackle, you just grab them by their shirt and try to, you know, manhandle them. That usually doesn't do very good. You got a certain way that you're supposed to stand. You stand a certain way, you get a stance, and you put that helmet in their number. And you reach around and grab them and top them. The smallest guy on the team, smaller than the enemy. trying to show these guys how to tackle. And I'm saying, you got to get down. You got to, you got to put your head in his number. You got to grab him and go down. Some of those big guys were letting go. People go past them all the time. They're trying to shirt tackle. So stop shirt tackling. Get them like I showed you. This little guy said, put me in, coach. That little bitty fella went out there. And did the way he was trained. He got down. He put his hand right in the numbers. He grabbed. And no matter how big the guy was, when they got in his area, they got canned. It was amazing to me because that little bitty fella was showing up all the big guys on the team because he did what he was taught. And it was amazing to watch him as he, that little bitty fella, was knock him down. If you just tried to grab him, you could pick him up and flick him like a flea. He's just so small. But when he would do, when he was in his zone, you come at him and he knew what he was supposed to do and he did what he was supposed to do. He would take him down no matter how big they were. They went down. Some of y'all are here right now. You've been shirt tackling the devil. It's time to pitch shirt tackling. Just grab what you can grab. Try to yank him down. Try to get him out your way. Leave me alone. Blah, 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 blah. It's time. To learn how to tackle that rascal. To get in like you're supposed to. Do what you're supposed to. You'll find that your life will change almost overnight. Maybe
maybe not, maybe not the stuff coming against you may not change, but the way you handle it will change. The way the outcomes are going to be are going to change. Your attitude, your outlook is going to change tremendously once you start doing it right. But it's got to begin here and here. Watch what God can do in your life. Everybody bow your head. Close your eyes.
went to the, we went to Pit Tension on Thursday night, and somebody, one of the prisoners, had actually, and I don't know why they did it this way, he wrote a grievance, and the grievance was he, he didn't get a Bible, he wanted a Bible, and wrote a grievance, and so Sister Boone was in there when I came, he says, make sure this guy gets the Bible. He wrote, he didn't put a request up like everybody else does. You just request, you want a Bible, we'll bring it to you. He put a grievance. And so I said, I'll make sure I get him. Well, you know how I am sometimes. I get so busy doing stuff that I may lay something down and forget where I laid it. Well, I laid down the grievance and forgot about it. The very first place I go, in D5, I go into D, I go into D, oh, excuse me, I'm going to D1. I go into D1, I minister to all these guys, and this one guy says, can you come talk to me, Pastor? So I go talk to him, and I already asked him who needed Bibles, and he said, I need one, so I brought his Bible up to him, and I'm talking to him. And as I'm talking to him, he goes, you know, God has just really started working on me, and I don't know exactly what I'm doing, I don't know how to do it, whatever he says. Need some guidance. He said, Can you tell me how to pray that really gets God's attention? And we've been doing it on, on uh, Tuesday nights. So I told him about the Lord's Prayer. And we prayed and took his Bible in the market. And then, and then he said, Is this going to get me through to God? I said, That will. I said, But if you want to really want God to work with you, you've got to be born again. He said, What does that mean? And I explained it to him. And I turned to Romans chapter 10, verse 9. I went and I read it and I circled it and I marked it for him. And then we, get, we prayed. And I ministered to him for the longest time. He was so happy. When, we, when I left, he was excited. He said, I can't wait to see what God will do. And blah, blah, blah. It was just awesome. I go down. And uh, I think Doug might even ask me. Or somebody asked me, did I, did I give the guy with the grievance his Bible? I looked at the grievance paper because I forgot about it. And that was the place I had stopped at and worked with the most and led the guy to Christ and showed him how to pray and all this stuff. And I said, wow, I didn't answer his grievance, but God did. <laughs> it was amazing to me how God does things like that. So, so again, trust God to do things with you you never would imagine that you could do, especially on your own. But with God, all things are what? That's right. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together. And then, then when we get through saying the Lord's Prayer together, I'm going to ask Brandon to dismiss us in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom power and the glory forever. Amen. All right, brother.